I'd like to introduce Larens van der Martin, who's our speaker today. He's going to talk about a new visualization technique that works better than any other technique for laying out large data sets in 2D maps so you can see the structure of them. Larens got his PhD in computer vision from Tilburg, as we say in English, in 2009. Um, he did a postdoc at UCSD with Lawrence Saul in machine learning. Um, he's now an assistant professor at um, Delft University of Technology. In 2008, he visited Toronto for six months, where we worked together on developing TSNE. Um, I'm very proud of one of my contributions, which was to think outside the box and say it would work better if we made the probabilities of a set of mutually exclusive events add up to four. And Lawrence now tells me it works better if we make them add up to 12. Okay, <laughs> Lawrence. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, thanks for, uh, for having me. It's great to be here. Um, so I'll talk today about the work I've been doing with Jeff and that I've continuing since I visited in, uh, in Toronto on visualizing data using uh, TSNE. So the setting we consider in this, uh, in this talk is we're given a bunch of high dimensional objects, uh, in this case the book called X1 to XN, and we want to get a feel for what the structure, sort of the underlying structure of, the data, of this data is. We want to know, like, are there sort of certain clusters in there? Is there, uh, what, what is the sort of the more local structure of this, uh, of this data manifold that is formed by the, uh, uh, by the high dimensional inputs? And so the question is, well, how can we get a feel? How can we get an intuition for, you know, how this high dimensional data is arranged in data space? And if you look at the information visualization field, they have a lot of, uh, they've developed a lot of methods to do data visualization. You may be familiar with uh, parallel coordinates, or maybe these radial graph layouts, uh, maybe things like tree maps, or I'm sure you've seen worlds before. And if I look at these, then they sh all share sort of one common characteristic, or well, maybe two. They're all very colorful and nice, and they all only visualize a few variables at a time. Um, and well, since uh, also at Google, presumably you're often in a situation where you have many variables. The question is, well, how can we visualize very high dimensional data, right? How can we, how can we deal with this sort of very large number of, uh, of, of variables? How can we get an insight into those? And so a simple idea to uh, solve this problem would be to try and build a map uh, in which each of the high dimensional objects is going to be represented by a point in such a way that uh, similar objects are going to be uh, represented by nearby points and the dissimilar objects are going to be represented by distant points. And these points we're going to embed in some low dimensional map of maybe two or three dimensions. Um, and well, if we manage to properly construct a map, then we can uh, lay out this two or three dimensional map. Uh, basically, we can visualize it as a scatter plot. And this hopefully gives us some insight in, in, in the data. So here's an example of that where we have a bunch of, of high dimensional data. We try to embed it in uh, a two dimensional space. And clearly we didn't do a very good job because the, basically the distances between the points in the low dimensional map are very different from the high dimensional map. Um, and so what we want to end up with is more with something like this, right? Where the uh, distances in this low dimensional map reflect the uh, similarities in the original high dimensional data. And to do this, we're going to minimize some objective function that basically measures the discrepancy uh, between the similarities in the original data and the dissimilarities in the map. And so this is called dimension reduction or embedding or multidimensional scaling. And a typical technique that you can use to, uh, um, uh, to, to, to do this is, is principal components analysis, which basically finds a linear projection of your high dimensional data in such a way that the variance of the projected data is maximized. And so here's an example of a typical map that you would get from principal component analysis. Uh, so this is a visualization of 5,000 uh, images of handwritten digits uh, from the, taken from the MNIST data set. And so what I did here is I just took the original images, which have 28 by 28 pixels, and uh, I laid them out using PCA in two dimensions. And so each point here corresponds to a digit in the data set, and the color of the point corresponds to the uh, digit that is represented in the, uh, in the image. And so what you see here is that uh, PCA captures some of the structure of this data. For instance, the red points on the left, they form sort of a cluster of zeros. Uh, 
And the uh, orange points on the right, they form a cluster once, and that it happens to be the first principal component. So sort of the main source of variation between digits is basically between zeros and ones. And that makes sense if you think about them in terms of pixel values, right? Zeros and ones have very little uh, overlapping pixels. The second principal component in this case is on the top, you basically get four sevens and nines, which are a bit similar uh, in terms of pixel values. And on the bottom, you get three fives and eights, which are also a bit similar. So that's your, sort of your second source of, uh, of variation. Now, this looks all very nice, but that's mainly because I, I put in the colors. If you were in the, um, in the uh, uh, unlabeled case where you didn't have sort of uh, proper labels for your data, you'd see something like this, and you'd not be able to make very much out of it, right? Maybe on the right, bottom right, you would see a little bit of high density structure, but it would basically just be sort of one blob of data. So the question is, can we do better? And in particular, the question is, uh, is PCA, is that minimizing the right objective function? And if you think about PCA, then basically what it's doing, it's mainly concerned, concerned with preserving large pairwise distances in the map. Uh, it's trying to maximize variance, which is sort of the same as trying to minimize uh, a squared error between distances in the original data and distances in the map. And because you're looking at a squared error, you're mainly concerned with preserving distances that are very large, right? So all that PCA is doing is it wants to make sure that stuff that's dissimilar, that that ends up far apart, right? Like the zeros and ones. Uh, and the question is, is that really what you want in a visualization? And in particular, are those large pairwise distances in the data, are those things that are uh, reliable? And I think the answer is no. Um, so if you, th if you think about data in terms of a nonlinear manifold, such as this Swiss roll here, then um, you, you would see that the, in this case, the Euclidean distance between, uh, between two points on this manifold would not reflect very well their similarity, right? This, uh, the distance between these two points suggests that the two data points are similar, whereas if you would consider the entire structure of the data manifold, they would actually be very far apart. Right, so the key idea is that, that PCA doesn't work so well for visualization because it, it preserves large pairwise distances, uh, and those are not reliable. What is reliable, even on these type of manifolds, are very small ones, right? The very small Euclidean distances, distances between points and their nearest neighbors, those are still pretty accurate uh, also on uh, very curved data manifolds like this. So people realized this in about 2000, and they started up coming up with techniques that were basically focusing on uh, preserving this local structure and preserving small pairwise distances in the map. And an example of such a technique is isomap. Um, and uh, basically what it does is it, it, tries, to, it tries to estimate uh, the distances between points in the original space via some geodesic distance. Right, so it basically tries to uh, estimate the distance over the manifold in this case, and then uses those distances as input into PCA. And it will give you something like this, and you can see that the, um, that the embedding is a bit better. For instance, the cluster of ones, which is the orange cluster here, is, uh, is fairly well separated from uh, the rest of the data. But even here, if it would take out the colors, you wouldn't see so much structure. Another example of, uh, of a method is, is called locally linear embedding, and uh, it would produce this plot on the, uh, on the MNIST data set. Um, the main, the, the locally, uh, locally linear embedding is very similar to, uh, to TSNI in the sense that it really tries to preserve small pairwise distances, but it has a kind of funny thing where what it really likes to do is collapse all points onto the origin. And so what you see here this is basically the origin of the, um, uh, of the data. Um, and then it uses a bunch of outliers to satisfy a very simple covariance constraint that it has on this embedding. And so typically what you see if you do embeddings with locally linear embedding is you see a whole bunch of points collapse, and then you see a few strings flying out basically to satisfy this covariance constraint that it has. Now, we basically built on the idea of, uh, of locally linear embedding, and we tried to, to come up with a better technique. In, in particular, we tried to come up with a technique that doesn't have this, this problem of trying to collapse all points onto a single point. And so this is the, the t-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding uh, technique, or t-SNE, uh, uh, abbreviated. And uh, here's sort of how it works. 
So in a high-dimensional space, we're going to measure similarities between points. Um, and uh, we're going to do that in such a way that we're only going to look at sort of local similarities. So at similarities to nearby points. Um, so the red point here is point xi. So this is a point in the high-dimensional uh, space. And what we're going to do is we're going to center a Gaussian over this point. And now we're going to measure the density of all the other points under this Gaussian. So in this case of point xj. So we're going to measure the density of all other points under this Gaussian. And then we're basically going to renormalize, which is the bottom part of the, uh, of the fraction here. Um, and what this gives us is a set of probabilities, pij, which uh, basically measure the similarity between uh, pairs of points ij. You can think of this as a probability distribution over pairs of points, where the probability of picking uh, a particular pair of points is proportional to their similarity. Right? If two points are close together in the original high dimensional space, you're going to have a large value for pij. If two points are dissimilar or far apart in a high dimensional space, you're going to get a pij that is basically infinitesimal. All right, so now we have an idea of, uh, of what the similarities, the local similarities of points in the high dimensional space are. Um, and so now the question is, how, how are we going to use them? Well, in, in, um, in practice, uh, we, we actually compute the PIJ values a bit differently. So what we do in practice is we're not uh, computing joint, uh, uh, joint probabilities over pairs of points where we're actually going to compute a conditional distribution. So everything that has changed here is basically uh, uh, the bottom part of the fraction here, where we don't normalize over all pairs of points, but only over pairs of points that involve uh, basically point xi. And the reason we do this is because it allows us to set uh, a different bandwidth, uh, sigma i for each point. And the way we're setting the bandwidth is basically in such a way that the conditional distribution has a fixed perplexity. So you can think of this as basically uh, scaling the bandwidth of the Gaussian in such a way that uh, a fixed number of points fall in the mode of this, uh, of this Gaussian. The reason we do this is because different parts of the space may have sort of different densities. And this trick basically allows us to adapt to those different densities. And then next what we do is it's, uh, it's sort of a hack where we say, well, the, um, the joint probabilities, right? So this distribution over pairs of points, uh, PIJ, is just going to be the, symmetri uh, the symmetrized version of the conditionals, right? So we're going to take the two conditionals involved, P of J given I and P of I given J, and we're going to uh, basically average those. Uh, and that's giving us uh, the final similarities in the high dimensional uh, space. So now the question is, well, what, what are we going to do with those? Well, so what are we going to do is uh, now we're going to look at the low dimensional space. So this is a two or three dimensional space, right? This will be our final map. And we're going to uh, lay out points in that, uh, in that map. And so we're going to represent each high dimensional object by a point in this low dimensional map. Uh, so again, the red square here is, uh, is uh, a point I, in the low dimensional case, I will call them y sub i. Um, and we're basically going to do the same thing here. So again, we're going to center uh, uh, some kernel over this point uh, y sub i. And we're going to measure the density of all the other points y sub j under that uh, distribution. And uh, again, we're going to renormalize by dividing over all pairs of points. And so what this gives us is uh, a probability qij, which basically measures the similarity of two points in the low dimensional map, right? So now what we want to do is, what we want is we want these probabilities qij to reflect the similarities pij, which we computed in high dimensional space, as well as possible. Right? If the QIJs are basically identical to the PIJs, then apparently the structure of the map is very similar to uh, the structure of the data in the original high dimensional space. And well, the way we're going to measure the, basically the difference between these PIJ values in high dimensional space and the QIJ values in the low dimensional map is by kubic leibler divergence which is sort of the standard measure of uh, a sort of a natural divergence, uh, natural distance measure uh, between probability distributions. And it takes the form uh, that I have here on the slides. So it's a sum over all pairs of points 
of pij times log pij over qij. And now what we're going to do is, well, what we want is we want to lay out these points in the low dimensional space in such a way that uh, this callback library divergence is minimized, right? In such a way that the QIJ values are as similar as possible to the PIJ values. And in order to do that, we're basically going to do gradient descent in this callback library divergence, which boils down to just moving the points around uh, in such a way that uh, this callback library divergence becomes small. Now the only thing, uh, well, so, so why do we look at a cubic library divergence? Why does this preserve local structure? Well, this basically has to do with the asymmetry of the cubic library divergence. Um, if you think about having two similar uh, high dimensional points, right? Two high dimensional points that are close together. These points will have a large PIJ value. Right? And if you have a large PIJ value in the Kubek library divergence, well, then you better make sure that these two points, that this pair of points also get, uh, gets a large QIJ value, because otherwise you're going to suffer a large penalty in the Kubek library divergence. Right? Otherwise, you're going to get a large value PIJ times the log of a large value of PIJ divided by a small value of QIJ, which is basically going to blow up. Right? So, what this Kubek library divergence does is it really tries to model large PIJs, so similar uh, high dimensional points, by large QIJs, so points that are close together in the two dimensional map. It doesn't work the other way around, so if you have two points that are uh, very dissimilar, so that have small PIJ, then you don't really care about what the, uh, the corresponding QIJ value is. Right? So we're really only looking at getting sort of the local structure of the data, right? Um, now, the only question I didn't answer yet, you may have noticed it, in when I was computing the QIJs, I wasn't using a Gaussian kernel, right? I wasn't using this thing uh, e to the power of minus a half times the square Euclidean distance between the points, but I was using something else. And what I was using was basically this uh, thing, which is a student T distribution with one degree of freedom which is a, a distribution that's a lot more heavy tilt uh, than uh, the Gaussian distribution. And so the question is, well, why, why do I use this student T distribution? Um, and the reason is as follows. So let's suppose our data was intrinsically high dimensional, right? So for instance, it was uniformly sampled from like a 10 dimensional hypercube. Um, and we're going to project this data down to two dimensions, right? And so as a result, we can never preserve all the pairwise distances accurately. We need to compromise somewhere. And well, so as we saw, what Tisney was doing was, his tr was trying to model local structure, right? It was trying to get similar stuff close together in the map. And what that means is that uh, as a result of that, that dissimilar points, right? So dissimilar high dimensional data has to be modeled too far apart in the map. Um, now I'll illustrate that with a, a very simple example where I have three points in two-dimensional space. And the red lines I'm going to call basically the small distances, right? So the local structure. And uh, the, 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 the uh, distance between the two other, uh, the two points on the, on the corners of this triangle, uh, I'm going to call that global structure, right? So a large pairwise distance. And I'm going to embed this data in 1D while preserving local structure. Well, I can do this perfectly well. Right? I can do this embedding into, uh, into one dimension, and you can see that the, the two small pairwise distances are completely accurately preserved. But what you also see happening is that the distance between the two points that are far away have, have grown. Right? These two points are now further apart than they were in the original data. Right? Before they were basically square root two apart, and now they have a distance of two. Right? And so if you're embedding intrinsically high dimensional data into low dimensional maps, this happens a lot, right? There are a lot of pairs of dissimilar points and these dissimilar points, uh, they basically have to be modeled too far apart in the map. Now by using this heavy tail distribution, I'm basically allowing that to happen. So if I have two, if I have a pair of points that have a pairwise distance of let's say 10, and let's say that under the Gaussian, it gives me a density of one, then to get the same density under the student t distribution, right? So the density of 0.01, because of the heavy tails of the student t distribution, these points have to be 20 or 30 apart, right? So for dissimilar points, these heavy tailed QIJs basically allow dissimilar points to be modeled too far apart in the map. 
All right, so let's, let's run TSNE on the same MNIST uh, data set. So what you see here is basically uh, TSNE running gradient descent, doing the learning, doing the minimization of the Kubrick library divergence. And what you see appearing is uh, basically a lot, of, uh, a, a lot more structure than you had in the PCA or isomap plots. Right? What you can see here is that the, the 10 clusters, the 10 different digits, that they're fairly well, uh, 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 fairly well separated in this, uh, this low-dimensional map. And if you would run it a little longer, you'd even get something that looks like this, right? where you get quite large gaps uh, between the different clusters. And you have to keep in mind that I just ran this on, uh, just based on the pixel values, right? and that the, uh, the labels of the digits were not used in producing the embedding. The only time I use the, uh, the labels of the, uh, of the digits is basically to color the plot. Right? So, but it's a completely unsupervised thing. And so apparently, if you, if you think about digit space, a lot of the digits are actually very, very well separated in this digit space already, uh, which, basically, uh, which basically means that we, can, that we can learn to separate them quite well. Now, if you plot back the original digit images, you would see something like this. Uh, and what this shows is basically uh, that also a lot of the local structure of the data is preserved in the embedding. For instance, here you can see uh, the zeros going from round zeros on the left to more elongated ones on the right. If you zoom in on the top here, you basically see a lot of orientation, uh, uh, a lot of orientation differences between these digits. And what you can also see is, for instance, on the bottom of the sevens, you can see a little cluster of so-called continental sevens, which are the sevens that have a little horizontal crossbar, and they are separated from, uh, from the rest of the sevens. Uh, if you look closely between the nines and the fours, there will be a few digits for which it's very hard to make out whether they're actually a nine or a four. And you see that showing up very well in the, uh, um, uh, in the embedding here. Right? So what this is showing is that we didn't just preserve sort of the global layout of the data, but that we also preserved a lot of local structure. Now, the way I use this is when I'm doing, I'm, I'm somebody who comes from machine learning, so I do a lot of feature extraction from data, in this case from uh, images of, uh, uh, of texture that were uh, basically made under, photographed under different viewpoints. And so here, for instance, I was interested in developing uh, texture descriptors that are invariant under locally uh, affine transformations. And once I've developed these features, these descriptors, I can basically use TSNE to, uh, to evaluate whether these features actually capture what I was interested in. Um, and so I made a TSNE plot based on these features. And then you see basically that all the brick walls cluster very closely together, irrespective of under what, uh, under what viewpoint they were photographed. Right? So apparently, uh, the features that I developed uh, really captured what I was after, namely this locally affine invariance. So here are some other examples of that, uh, for instance, of I think this is some type of uh, presumably water. Um, and here is an example of basically carpet. Right? So what you can see is that, uh, that TSNE can help you basically in developing and evaluating new features. It's going to give you more information than just measuring the classification error uh, based, that, that you get based on, uh, based on some feature representation, because it's also going to give you some insights into what this feature representation is capturing and, and maybe also what it is not capturing. Now, it's interesting to look in a bit more detail in, uh, into the gradient of this Kubrick library divergence that we're minimizing. So the gradient with respect to a point, right? So basically, how do we have to move a single point Y sub I in the map um, in order to get a, low, uh, a lower Kubrick library divergence? Takes this form. And if you look at it closely, you can basically see that it consists of a spring between a pair of points, in this case, between points F and, and C in the, uh, in the visualization. And this other term is basically a term that measures the amount of exertion or compression of the spring. So what you see is basically a difference between Pij, the similarity in the high dimensional space, and Qij, the similarity in the low dimensional space. Right? So if, if the, the Qij's perfectly model the, the Pij's, then this term uh, would basically be zero. Right? There, would no, there would be no force in the spring. And what this sum is basically doing is it's taking all forces that act on the single point and uh, it's summing them up, them up, right? So the way to think of this is 
all points exert a force, in this case on, uh, on point C, and what, we, what we're after is computing the resultant force on that point C, right? And that resultant force basically tells us how we have to move the point in order to get a lower cubic light divergence. Now, one limitation of this is, is that we basically have to consider all pairwise interactions between points, right? If we have n points, then we basically have to look at n squared uh, interactions between points, and those we have to sum basically in every gradient update. Um, and this is sort of limiting if you're going to visualize uh, data sets that are larger than, let's say, five to 10,000 uh, 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 objects. Um, and uh, so what I worked on is on uh, an approximation uh, to these forces that basically operates in n log n. Um, and as a result, that scales up much better to, uh, to large data sets. And uh, the intuition for uh, this approximation is that if you have a bunch of points, in this case A, B, and C, uh, that are close together and that uh, exert a force on some point, in this case I, that is relatively far away, then uh, these three forces will be pretty much the same, right? They will be very similar. Um, and as a result, what we could do is we could basically take the center of mass of these three points, compute uh, the, the interaction between the center of mass and the point that we're interested in, multiply it by the number of points involved, in this case three, and use that as an approximation for these three forces. And this is what is called the Barnes-Hutt approximation. It originally comes from astronomy, where astronomers try to basically model the interactions between stars. They have very large galaxies of stars, so they need uh, these type of analog N algorithms. So the way we implement this in practice is, uh, in this case, we did it via a quad tree. So a quad tree is sort of a space partitioning tree. Uh, so the, the partitioning is on the map here, right? So on the two-dimensional map that we're constructing. And basically each node of the tree corresponds to a cell. So the root node corresponds to, uh, uh, to basically the entire map. And then it has four children. Uh, each node has four children, which basically correspond to uh, the smaller, uh, the smaller, uh, the four quadrants of, uh, uh, of um, basically the cell of the root node, um, or of the parent node. And what we're storing in, in each of these nodes is we're storing the number of points that sits in a cell, and we're storing a, the center of mass, which is this little blue circle that I plotted here. Um, and we're basically building a full quad tree, which means that we're uh, proceeding until every cell contains only a single uh, data point, right? So a single point in the map. Um, and we can use this quad tree to quickly uh, do the barnes hutt approximation. Uh, so what we do is we're basically going to do a depth first search on this tree. And so at every, uh, so in this case, we're interested in computing the interactions with point F, uh, which is down there. Um, and basically at every, um, at every point in the depth first search, we're going to ask, well, is this cell, is this far enough away from point F? And is this small enough uh, such that we can basically use the cell as a summary uh, uh, for the interactions? Well, in this case, in the root case, uh, well, we're basically looking at the whole map, so that's probably going to be too big. Uh, so this condition is going to fail. So we're going to do a depth first search, and we get to uh, this cell. And let's say in this case that our condition says, well, you know, this, this top left cell, that's small enough and far away enough from point F so that we can use it uh, as a summary node. Well, then basically what we can do is we can take the center of mass that we stored um, in this node, we can compute their interaction with point F. We multiply it by the number of, basically the number of children, the number of points in this, uh, in this cell, which was three. And we also stored that in the quad tree, uh, uh, in, the, in the quad tree that we built. And uh, this gives us uh, basically a summary of the interactions between points A, B, and C on one side and F on the other side. Right, and so then we can prune basically everything that sits under it. And we basically are going to continue uh, our depth first search. Right, and this gives you uh, an analog N algorithm for basically evaluating the gradients. And as a result, it scales up a lot better to very large data sets. Uh, so to show you an example, uh, this is a visualization of uh, the full MNIST data set, which contains 70,000 uh, digits. And this was made in about 10 minutes on a single uh, core, which with the original N squared uh, algorithm would be completely unthinkable. It would take many, many days to uh, construct something like this. And you can see that also in this map, 
um, that the uh, the structure of the data is is preserved quite well, right? That you still get sort of these ten uh, separate clauses. If we plot back the original digits again, we get something like this. Uh, and if you zoom in there, you can still see that a lot of the local structure is there. So here you see a little bit of orientation showing up. And you see it going from thin ones on the right to thicker ones on the, uh, on the left. Um, so here's another example of a whole bunch of zeros, which are apparently quite similar. Uh, and here's a visualization of, um, takes a little bit, of sixes um, going from sort of more elongated sixes on the left to more round ones on the, uh, on the right. As a second example, this is a visualization I did of the uh, CIFAR-10 data set, which is a data set of uh, um, images of 32 by 32 pixels that were crawled from, uh, from Google Images. Uh, and that basically have 10 different labels, which are listed on the, on the top right here. Um, and the representation I built here was basically a bag of visual words uh, representation using spatial pyramids. Um, and so then this is the map that I get. And what you can see is that apparently this representation is not being a, is not able to capture sort of the, the f um, really able to capture sort of the differences between these 10 different classes. So it would be interesting to, for instance, try uh, all the deep learning stuff that Google is doing, get those features, put them into TSNI and see if you get a better map. You should. Um, still, even the bag of visual words, if you plot back the original images, is able to capture quite a bit of, uh, of structure. You can see that sort of in the plot here. And if we, if we zoom in, we see, for instance, that um, the CIFAR-10 data set contains a lot of pictures of red cars, uh, which are all grouped together here. Um, it likes to group together uh, planes on the right and boats on the left because they all are sort of a, uh, a, a structure with strong edges on a, a very uniform background. Um, here's another example of uh, apparently there are a lot of animals in the, uh, in the CIFAR-10 data sets, which are all sort of grouped together. And this was a nice little cluster of uh, people making images of their dogs. Now, to give you a Google example, so this is a visualization I did actually yesterday of the Street View house numbers data set. So these are about 6, uh, 600,000 images uh, that, look, that look like this. Um, and the representation I used here were basically histogram of oriented gradient features. And based on those features, I, uh, I laid those out in a map. And this took, I think, about one and a half hours on my, uh, on my laptop to uh, construct this map. Um, and what you can see here is actually a quite good separation between the different classes, although some classes will be split up in two parts. And one thing that I think might be going on is that there are sort of small translations between the images um, that basically cause a large effect in the, uh, in the histogram of oriented gradient features, right? Because the edges are basically moving. And th I think that's why you get the, uh, the separation of the classes here. So the, the biggest data set I ran this on so far is the TIMID data set, which is a, uh, a speech uh, data set. So it contains about 1.1 million uh, instances that are represented, so little speech segments that are represented using MFCC uh, features. And so the labels here are basically phone labels for these, uh, these speech segments. And so this one takes about three and a half hours to build on a, uh, on a single core. Now, there's one last map which I want to show you. So this map wasn't done by me. It was done by Joseph Thurian uh, at the University of Montreal. Uh, but I'm going to show it because it's very nice and also because it highlights uh, a problem that we're going to try and solve afterwards. So it's a, word, uh, it's a map of words. Um, so basically what, what Joseph did is he learned uh, a feature representation for these words, basically from Wikipedia. It's a type of word embedding model. And he used these features uh, as input into TSNI. And you see a lot of structure in this uh, model. So for instance, you see a lot of spatial locations. And it's actually going from locations inside the US on the top to uh, locations outside of the US on the bottom. You get a nice tight cluster of all your 12 months. Um, there's, a, there's a cluster of names, and it actually goes from first names on the top to last names on the bottom. And so what you can see is that you know, these, these embedding features apparently uh, capture a lot of these sort of fine-grained semantic information. Uh, here's a, a, a cluster of, uh, of words that are all 
uh, basically related to counting, uh, to numbers. Here's a very large cluster of all sorts of adverbs. Um, there is a nice little uh, sports cluster. Now, the reason I'm showing this map is because it also highlights a problem. Namely, if you are modeling, uh, if you're trying to embed words, if you're trying to visualize words based on semantic similarities uh, in a single map, you can never do it quite right. Um, so let's suppose you want, to, um, uh, you want to model the words river, bank, and bailout in a single map. Uh, well, the word river has a semantic similarity to bank. The word bank has a semantic similarity to bailout, but the words river and bailout have basically nothing in common, right? And so in a single map, you can never do it right, because if you're going to put river close to bank and bank close to bailout, river and bailout by the triangle inequality are going to be close together. Um, so if you have data that's basically of which the uh, similarity structure, the underlying structure is non-metric, right? It doesn't satisfy the triangle inequality, you can never do it right. And this can happen if you visualize words based on association data, but also if you were uh, visualizing authors based on uh, co-authorship. Um, I could have written a lot of papers with Jeff Hinton. And Jeff Hinton maybe has written a lot of papers uh, with Terry Sanofsky, but I never wrote a paper with Terry Sanofsky. So we cannot be visualized correctly in a map. So what we did is uh, we tried to get around this problem by not constructing a single map, but by constructing multiple maps. So what we're going to do is we're going to give each word an embedding in each of the maps. And we're also going to assign a weight to each word in each of the maps. And now all of a sudden we can, uh, we can correctly model this river bank bailout example. Because what we can do is in map one, we can put river and bank close together with high weight. In this case, weight one for river and weight a half for bank. And so the word bailout is also in map one, but it has weight zero, right? So that's why I'm not visualizing it. Um, so that basically puts river and bank close together. And now in map two, we're going to put bailout uh, and bank close together with high weight. And we're going to give river weight zero in that, uh, in that second map. Um, and as a result, what we get is we basically unraveled these two different senses of the word bank, right? Um, so the way we mathematically define it is we're going to redefine the similarities QIJ, which were the similarities between basically word I and J uh, under the model, in this case, the multiple maps model. And uh, so what the uh, I sub I super M is, is basically the embedding of word I in map, uh, in map M. And this pi here is going to be basically the word of, um, the, the, sorry, the weight of word I in map M. And so what we're computing here is uh, the similarity between two words in map M, between, two, between words I and J. We're going to multiply this with the weights for these words involved. And we're basically going to sum over all maps. Right? And this gives us basically a new definition of, uh, of the similarities QIJ under the model. Um, and now what we're going to do when we're learning is we're basically going to take the same callback light with our virgins and we're going to minimize it again using standard gradient descent. Um, except we're not now just minimizing with respect to the locations of the words in a single map, but we're doing it with respect to the locations of the words in all of the maps and with respect to the weights of the words in these maps, right? So we're basically taking all these parameters and we're going to learn everything uh, simultaneously. Now we applied this on a data set of word association data that was gathered by psychologists. So there are about 5,000 words. And basically the way they gathered the data was they took human subjects and they would, uh, they would tell the human subject a word and uh, the subject would have to respond with sort of the first associated word that, uh, that came to mind. So they repeated this a whole bunch of times. And basically what that gives them is a probability, given that I say the word I, what is the probability that uh, the human subject will produce uh, the word J, right? And so these similarities are exactly the type of similarities that we can use as input into t or multiple maps t in this case. Um, so we made a visualization of, uh, of this data in, uh, in 40 maps. And so you see two of the maps here. And what you see in the top part is, for instance, the word cheerleader, uh, which apparently has a strong association with uh, words that have to do with sports, right? Like uh, uh, basketball, football, uh, tackle, stuff like that. Uh, 
which is uh, you know, a clear association of the word cheerleader. Now, if we look in one of the other maps, we also see the word cheerleader, but here she goes with uh, gorgeous and sexy and beauty, which is a completely different type of association of the word uh, cheerleader that clearly has nothing to do with sports, right? And so the multiple maps model basically automatically learned this. As a second example, so here are two of the, uh, two of the other maps. Um, so let's, let's take an, as, as an example the word monarchy, which is here modeled close to basically state forms like democracy and republic, uh, and anarchy even. Um, and in one of the other maps, we see uh, the association of the word monarchy basically with the pageantry uh, surrounding the monarchy, right? Like king and crown and royal and stuff like that, right? So these sort of very subtle senses are actually picked up from uh, the word association data in these visualizations. Um, now, on my website, I actually have a sort of an interactive D3 tool that you can use to play around with all 40 maps. Uh, I was going to show it, but the laptop is a bit too slow to, uh, uh, to do it here. Uh, but you can check that out later if you're interested. So to conclude, I hope uh, that I have shown you that uh, by visualizing high dimensional data in maps, uh, that this basically may lead to sort of more insights into your data. Um, and that TSNI is an effective uh, and also a relatively efficient way of, uh, uh, of producing such maps. Um, and uh, I should mention that TSNI has already been applied in a lot of uh, domains, for instance, uh, bioinformatics, uh, computer security, climate research, cancer research, uh, and hopefully soon uh, also in a lot of uh, problems that Google is working on. Now, if you're interested in trying this out, there's code in various languages on my website, in uh, MATLAB, Python, uh, C++, and even R, I think. Uh, so it should be relatively easy to, uh, to try it out for yourself. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Yes. Very nice talk. So uh, when you're running gradient descent and kind of visualizing each iteration of that mm -hmm. data, the structure seemed to be pretty constant. And then you showed a picture of the final result and some clusters had sort of rearranged them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that was actually not the same run. So okay. one, of, one of the things is that um, basically all these, um, all these methods um, because they only look at basically the discrepancy between pairwise distances, there are, for instance, uh, invariant on the rotations of the map, right? If I rotate the map, then uh, the cost function is not going to change because the pairwise distances aren't changing, right? So um, the, 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 the objective function is a non-convex function. As a result, you're going to get slightly different results every time you run it, basically. So if you ever get very different results, then have to do random restarts of this kind of thing? So visually, from what I've seen, they all are quite, uh, quite similar. Uh, but you have to be a bit careful in how you interpret the maps. Right? So you have to take into account that it's really only trying to get sort of local structure right. So if a cluster of ones and zeros, if that's uh, uh, a distance like this apart or a distance like this, that basically doesn't mean anything. Right? So beyond sort of a certain distance, you should not assign meaning to uh, the distances you see in the map, right? It's only sort of the smaller distances that are uh, that are really telling you something. I'm sorry, I missed the first uh, half an hour. But uh, I have two questions, basically. One is that uh, does your address support the method you should be taking? At present, no. But uh, I would. It would be great if you would make one. <laughs> okay, so that's probably related to my second question. Uh, so, for, for example, for the method work, uh, actually, the work have a, a sort of a hierarchical they have some top concept that the policy or indication, and they are lower their uh, work. Mm -hmm. So currently, your uh, visualization is only on the Yes. Is there any way to make this hierarchical um, way to represent work? So it's kind of like in theory, so for instance, Google Maps. Go in and look out. At top that way, you have a top work. Yes, that's a great question. So I've been. I've been trying to do that, but so far I haven't been able to get it to work, right? So it would be really nice if you sort of would be able to make a hierarchical visualization where sort of in the top level, you basically, in a sense, group together groups of points or words, right? And only lay out the sort of similarities of these groups. And then in the lower levels, uh, basically work out these clusters and then lay those out and would be able to sort of connect it all together. Uh, so up till now, I wasn't 
I wasn't really able to, uh, to get this to work. And one of the main reasons was computational. Uh, until sort of earlier this year, we were only working with the n-squared uh, algorithm, also in producing, for instance, the multiple maps uh, plots. And this got quite slow over time, right? Because you, uh, if, you, if you're sort of building, building multiple visualizations simultaneously, which are all n-squared and then all also interact, uh, then it gets really hard. But I am planning on basically working on that idea again now that we have sort of this analog n approximation. Uh, and, and maybe are able to do it a lot faster. But it's a very, very interesting idea, yeah. I have a question about, I guess, generalization. Um, yeah, misunderstanding something, but like the displays you showed us here, for instance, like the end of the page, those are all the images that were trained on in some sense. That is not a holdout data set that was used to find the mapping to. Uh, no, so it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. So the. Um, the maps that we're learning is we're basically doing a type of non-parametric learning, right? Where we are only learning how to represent images by points in a map, but we're not actually learning a function from uh, the original high-dimensional space to the map, right? So if we now get sort of a new instance, if we get a new digit image, we don't really know where to put it in the map. Now, I've been doing work, I didn't present it here, on basically parameterizing this function using a deep network, a deep neural net, uh, where we would basically directly learn a function. And then, you, then you're able to also do generalization to, uh, to held out data. Um, and that worked actually quite well, but this was before the time when there was you know, dropouts and, uh, and also very big Google computers, at least for me. Um, um, so yeah, but the, it, it's, it's definitely something that's possible, except for in, in these plots that I'm showing, really the only thing we're interested in is in, in visualization, right? So I wouldn't advise you to use them to generalize or as part of a, of a classification system. It's really for inspection of your data. Uh, in your multi-map course, uh, is the number of maps the thing that you pick? Like, yes, it's like picking the number of clusters in the clustering uh, so technique. Words, I can sort of see maybe No, it's, it's quite hard. So one of the things I've been doing is you can basically, in the, originals, uh, in the original input similarities, you can look for each word, what are sort of my five nearest neighbors or my 10 nearest neighbors. And now I'm going to measure the same thing under the model, right? So based on the QIJ values. And now I'm basically going to cross-validate over the number of maps by basically measuring, okay, what percentage of nearest neighbors did I now preserve in my model? Um, but that's all, really only a hack. Yeah, in, in the same vein, that's not really something synonyms do. They don't come in matching layers. So it's a little weird for me to have an intuition around what to do with the multiple maps. Where I expected you to go is to split a word into multiple locally on the same map. Have you? Oh, on the same map. No, so, so each... Uh, so the way we implemented the model now, at least, each word has only one location in each of the maps, right? And so in, within a map, we cannot really split a word. Uh, it's something that we have tried at some point, but we, at that time, at least, we couldn't get it to, uh, couldn't get it to work, right? So the different senses of the, of the words or the different, different types of associations, I should say, right? Because they're not, re not really senses. Uh, those are sort of separated over, uh, over maps. And for a single word, Mm -hmm. um, I'm not exactly sure that I that I understand the question. I mean, if you if 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 you pick a sense for a particular word, right, then sort of in the in the cluster around it, there are going to be all words that are sort of related to this sense, right? That's sure. basically what you end up with. But you're on a whole map pretty much some slice of language. You're, you're at a bank, you're at a river, you're in a landscape, you're at mm -hmm. a tree. Right. Now you're pivoting around tree, meaning that you're ending up in a database tree. Mm -hmm. It's a different tree and you're on a different map. Mm -hmm. Is that going to be the same map that the bank financial institution is on or yet another different map? Well, you know, hard to make sense 
Okay, may maybe we should take this offline. Oh, no, All right. <laughs> yes. One of the variables you have in your model is the perplexity. Yes. Uh, what's the impact of playing with that variable? It's, it's actually quite robust. So basically what the perplexity is doing is it's uh, determining the size, uh, basically the variance of the Gaussian distributions that are used to measure similarities in the high dimensional space. And what it's doing, you can think of this perplexity as a type of effective number of nearest neighbors. Right, so if you set the perplexity to 30, you could roughly say that there are about 30 points that are sitting in the mode of this Gaussian, right? That's the way you set the, uh, the variance. Now in practice, uh, for, at least from my experiments, it seems like it's quite robust to this perplexity value, right? And, um, you typically for larger data sets, you want to set it a bit larger, right? Because, you, you, because they're basically just going to be sort of more points close to you that are similar, right? So you want to look at you would basically want to interact with more points. Um, but for sort of data sets of like five to 10,000 points, you'd typically be somewhere between 20, uh, like 10 and 50, something like that. But it's quite robust to that. Um, you will see that if you make it very small, that it will basically start seeing more clusters, right? Because it's looking sort of at a very small scale and at a very small scale, sort of these larger clusters, they may basically split up, right? So that's something that you can see happening. So the problem with that is that in the high dimensional space, basically the tails of this T distribution, they're going to blow up, right? They're basically going to contain all your probability mass. So we have tried it in the past, but it didn't work very well. Mm -hmm. Um. So at, at present, we haven't looked at that. So probably something I would do is I would train some sort of, uh, let's say, a factor analysis model, right, before I would do the PCA. So you could say, well, if I take my original very high dimensional data and I use a linear model to project it down into, let's say, 100 or 200 dimensions, then I'm not going to lose so much structure. Well, I, I might lose structure, but I wasn't going to be able to visualize that in two dimensions anyway. Right, so I would probably do something like train a factor analysis model, do EM over your uh, missing variables, and then use the resultant uh, representations you get for your, 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 uh, your sparse feature vectors as input into t -SNE. So I would do something like that. So, so basically in high dimensional space, you are able to plug in any distance measure that you have, right? So if you know that, you know, a cosine distance is sort of a more appropriate distance for your feature vectors than, uh, than the Euclidean distance, you can just plug that in your Gaussian kernel. Yeah, so this seems like you're using a non-measured kind of some analysis and you use other kind of examples. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so in, so in the case that your inputs are really sort of conditional probabilities, right, that's sort of the natural form of your data, which happens in the word association case, this data will be uh, non-symmetric. It, uh, it will basically violate the triangle inequality, right? It will be, the, the similarities will be intransitive. Um, and so this multiple maps model is, is able to deal with that by basically if you get these intransitive similarities by basically splitting up sort of the middle point into two senses and modeling both parts of the relation separately. So in the word association data, we don't use this Gaussian at all, right? Our, we immediately get our inputs. Uh, which are basically these probabilities P, I, J, right? We immediately get those because that's the natural form of the data, right? So then we immediately try to model those probabilities in the, in the map or in the maps. Okay, um, Lawrence is going to be around for the rest of today hanging out with the brain team. So if anybody has further questions or wants to talk with him in depth about stuff, um, just send, you can find him on the web, send an email to him on his ordinary account and... So we hang out with the burn team and we can find him.